those of you who have been following the story of Esther, the book of Esther with us over recent weeks will know that so far it's been the story of a self-absorbed king. The world ruler of the then known world, a man by the name of Xerxes, uh, known to history as Xerxes I. And Xerxes I uh, had lost his queen. Well, we say lost. Uh, the circumstances, as we know, were not that he'd mislaid her so much as he had expelled her uh, because she had refused to be his plaything, one of his trophies, uh, when he required her to appear uh, in court. So that King Xerxes finds himself without a queen. And his chums, we noticed last week, came up with the solution for the loss of his bedfellow. And uh, we noticed last week that it fulfilled their own uh, wildest dreams. Uh, that uh, a beautiful girl, every night, should be provided for the king. Uh, and uh, only after he had uh, tasted the field, as it were, would he choose from the best among them to be uh, his queen. What we are, have described for us, as I noticed last week, is really a legalised cull uh, followed by uh, an equally legalised rape of the most gorgeous women uh, in the empire. And uh, we're told last week we were informed that Hadassah, or Esther as she's better known, was caught in this net. Now in the present passage we're prepared for the fact that uh, Esther is going to have an important role. After all, she of all the women uh, to appear before Xerxes is mentioned by name. And so we're not particularly surprised that after the decreed period in which she goes through all the necessary beauty treatments, she proves the answer to Xerxes' dreams. She's beautiful, unlike Vashti, she's submissive, and she's beautiful, and clearly, as far as the king's concerned, good in bed. She's just the sort of replacement that Xerxes was looking for. And not surprisingly, he chooses her as his queen, and equally not surprisingly, in view of what we've learnt so far, he has a party. Uh, the Persian Empire seemed to love their parties. The book started with a party. It will continue with parties. Uh, but he celebrates uh, uh, the empire world celebration of the appointment the coronation of the new queen. This event took place, we know, in December uh, 479, so in the month that we're now sharing together, uh, or just about to. Uh, so this is probably uh, four or five years after the incident described uh, earlier uh, in the book. Um, he's been away to Greece, he's come back, he's perhaps uh, had to resolve how he's going to find this new queen. Uh, there would have been others who would have uh, been uh, to visit Xerxes before Esther. So we now know this is about five or six years uh, later. But you know, if we were writing this story, or if it had um, appeared uh, in a typically Persian story, uh, the story would have ended there. King loses queen. King finds new queen. They live happily ever after. End of story. But of course we've been already uh, prepared for the fact that it's not the end of the story. It's only part of the story. In fact, as we shall discover, it's, it's the introduction to the main drama uh, that is the book of Esther. There have been little things that have been of hints that there's going to be something else to follow. Uh, this reference to the nationality of Esther, the reference to the fact that she was sworn to secrecy as to her uh, nationality uh, by Mordecai, her uncle. There are also hints that Esther was, there was more to Esther than simply a submissive replacement queen. Everyone she meets, she seems to please. She pleased Hegai, she pleased the other uh, court officials, and she pleased the king. In fact, uh, it appears that she pleased the king not simply by meeting his fairly rudimentary uh, qualifications for what he considered to be a good woman. Uh, so there's something about Esther 
that marks her out and suggests to us that there is going to be more to this story than we might have expected. So we're left a number of tantalising hints uh, as to what may possibly be happening next. But before we get there, we have the last paragraph of chapter 2. Uh, the reference to Mordecai exposing uh, a plot to, king, to kill King Xerxes. Now actually, King Xerxes nine years later will be uh, assassinated by precisely such a plot, uh, but not yet. Uh, and Mordecai identifies the people who are involved in the plot. He reports it through Esther to the king. The plot is foiled and as was the case in ancient Persian uh, records, the event was recorded uh, in the records of the king. What we find is missing here, however, is the fact that Mordecai was rewarded. He wasn't. Now, in societies like ancient Persia, uh, you work on the basis of uh, a lord and a vassal, uh, and those relationships are established by gifts. So the expectation would have been that since Mordecai has effectively saved King Xerxes' life, Mordecai would receive some form of gift or preferment. But nothing happened. We don't know why. We can only guess. And perhaps next week we may have a few guesses as to why uh, this was the case. But we're told nothing uh, happened. So what are we to make of these verses? Perhaps it is to simply uh, ask the question, where's this story leading? Where's it going? Uh, but rather than simply leave it at that, this is part of our Bible, isn't it? So possibly we are intended to recognise that behind these apparently random events, something or someone is at work, hidden behind the story, not mentioned, as we've already come to comment before. The book of Esther never mentions the word God. And yet, are we being invited to reflect upon the fact that behind these apparently random events, God is at work, that he's orchestrating things, uh, that he will give meaning to apparently random and meaningless events. That he will bring good out of the wrongful. He will bring right out of the immoral. I would suggest to you that as the book opens up and develops, that is how we should read these verses that we've looked at this morning. God is mysteriously at work in what appear to us to be completely unrelated and random events. He's at work, performing his will, achieving his purposes. Now, those who wrote our Bible used a principle which you often see in the Bible when they apply it. They work on the basis that if it is true, if this is true in a small event, it's true in a big event. So if God has achieved something in your life or mine, he can achieve something still greater in the events of our world. But also the reverse is true. If God is randomly at work, or appears, is, is at work in what appear to be the random events of history, of our community, our nation, our world. If God is at work there, then the same God is working out his purposes in your life and mine. And we need to hear that, don't we? Because we look out on our world at the moment, which is a perplexing and puzzling world, with all the events that have happened in recent months. Uh, we live in a world that creates for us many questions. How do we respond? 
Mr Cameron's calling for a vote this week as to whether we should bomb Syria or not. Well, what's the answer to that? Uh, it's a confusing, uh, puzzling world. Uh, where is God in all these things? And what about our own situations, which often seem to be so random? The message of Esther, I would suggest the message of this pa passage, as things begin to unfold, is to say God is at work. He's at work where we wouldn't expect him to be at work. He's, he's not, he doesn't say, look, it's clear where I am here. Very often he doesn't reveal to us uh, where he is. He may appear to be absent, but actually he's working out his purposes for his world and for you and for me and that's the comfort that we're to take I think from this story uh, it's a story that, that is a story that troubles us in many ways or should trouble us what Esther had to go through was absolutely intolerable and unacceptable to any uh, humane standards of conduct the neglect of Mordecai for having saved the life of the greatest ruler of the ancient world. Uh, and he's just ignored. Life is sometimes like that. But God is working his purpose out. Let's pray together. Pray. Our Father, we thank you for this book of Esther once again. It presents us with issues that very often we don't reflect upon or if we reflect upon, we don't often reflect upon them in church and with an open Bible. But we thank you as we have our Bibles open. Uh, we can see that you are the God who is the God of those gaps in our life and experience where sometimes uh, we conclude that you're not part of the story. Help us to be confident that you are part of every story, the story of our world and the story of each one of us. And help us to gain confidence and trust and hope in you in the light of these events. For we ask it for Jesus' sake. Amen. <laughs>